Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, <coughs> and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Skull Camera Games, the... The Mad Men Behind slash the horror movie RPG, which managed to get funded in about two days. Congratulations on that. The one and only, the one and only Sam Clark. How are you doing today, man? I am doing all right. Um, I am kind of just relaxing. It, it has been a, a pretty good day, pretty good summer. Um, that and, of course, still working on the the game. But yeah. So. One of the traditions around here is the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Yes, so I've always kind of done role-playing type stuff, as in, you know, I was one of the kids running around um, playing with sticks at recess, pretending that, uh, that, sort, of, that sort of deal, you know. Um, so I kind of always did it, of like playing characters and stuff, but for tabletop role-playing games, it's, um, well, as generic as this sounds, uh, definitely D&D. Um, was that um, we, I was actually at uh, a running camp with my cross-country team, and there was this, uh, the team captain was a big D&D guy, and um, he, we, we all, we would play around the campfire. It was kind of like not real D&D, so to speak. It was like, you roll the dice, but you don't have any stats and stuff. But I just thought it was super cool because, like, I had been doing that sort of stuff where you're, like, playing a story and playing characters since I was a little kid. But, you know, there's a point when you get older where people stop doing it and you're kind of like, why? Um, but then apparently you can't do it anymore. And then to be in a place where everyone would still do it and it was actually cool to do it and everyone wanted to sit around the campfire and roll a 20-sided die, um, it, was, it was pretty fun. So after that, I got, um, like, the D&D starter set or whatever. I had no experience playing it, um, and I had just read the manual when some people came over like, hey, D&D, we should play it. And I was like, yes, right now. And then uh, from that, I started my first campaign, and it was very choppy, as one could expect, from someone who had just read the little starter kit, like 13 pages or whatever. Um, but um, I liked it so much and kept on going. Um, eventually, I kind of moved away from D&D into more like Powered by the Apocalypse stuff, um, but by then, I was already a hardened uh, GM and uh, player as well. Right, that that certainly makes sense, and it definitely does sound like you had jumped you had jumped around between multiple systems over the years. Oh yes, for certain. I uh, while I like um, stuff like D and D, and that will always be close to me because of that. I find that a lot of my friends. I have two main groups of uh, friends in the for that I get to play RPGs. That is, one is the board gamers. They like stuff like D and D for the most part. But then I have like my writer friends and my friends that are. Um, I'm uh, I study creative writing, so I have a lot of friends that do that, and um, they they cannot understand how to play a board game. Sometimes, no offense. Um, if they look have to read through you know pages of spells, they will not do it. So getting something simpler, like um, a Power by the Apocalypse thing, I'm a big fan of City of Mist. Um, that is a great game. I've been playing that with um, some of my writer friends. It's nice to have, I feel like, kind of a game that, you know, some are better, systems are better for people that prefer a simpler game, want to more tell a story, and then some people like to sit down and spend a long time fighting our Narcana Loth and getting their, their ass handed to them. But yeah. Mm-hmm. And... What prompted the what prompted the interest in doing a game based on horror movies? Uh, yeah, so I always love horror movies. I'm a huge fan. Um, it's just super fun. I'm a big I'm big into tropes, like tropey stuff as well. I like bad media, like media that shouldn't be good, um, and like all those bad horror movies um, because it's just like it's so nice. It's so refreshing, and well, not refreshing. I guess it's just like. You know, when people are behaving stupid in a horror movie, it's just like, a lot of people are like, ah, oh, why would they do that? But I'm like, yes, yes, do it. Run into the chainsaw shack. Um, and I don't know, it just is fun. Um, and then for horror, like, so that's the horror movie side. 
the horror game is that I did a lot of DMD shots um, that were horror based because I like making things in a campaign. I don't particularly like killing players. Like obviously, it sometimes happens. Um, but you know, because I want their character to stay there for a story. But in a one shot, I really like making the stakes high, and one way to do that is horror because you know. In a one-shot, it doesn't particularly matter. Like, it does matter if players die, but it's like, it's not going to ruin the whole campaign or make them sad forever. They've made their character, they know it might happen. Um, so I really liked those kind of... It, it, it made people super invested and feel like they're, like, they couldn't just, you know, run around and do everything. They had to actually think about stuff. Um, it made for super interesting kind of mysteries. You know, you can make a kind of mystery-oriented uh, one-shot. And basically a combination of it being my interest in one shots and like playing with different groups of people that you can kind of get over in a brief amount of time and things that had high stakes without being like loads and loads of combat um made made me really interested in horror because it's something that like you know horror movies even now when movies are getting to be three hours most horror movies unless you're Ari Aster are uh an hour and a half and for RPGs that can translate to a one shot two sessions something like that where you know I can do that for a little bit and then even if the same group wants to play again, it's not like I need to do the same story. You can do something else. If you want to do a sequel, you can do a sequel. If you want to be like, well, let's go to space now. You can do a sci-fi one, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And just a shot in the dark. At, at, any, at any point in time, did you ever watch Mystery Science Theater 3000? I did, in fact, watch <laughs> Mystery Science Theater 3000. Um, because, as you can probably tell, it's my love of bad movies. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's great. Uh, speaking of RPGs for that, there's this great RPG called, ah, uh, god, what is it called? Uh, they Came From Beneath the Sea. I think it was yep. featured on uh, Mystery Science Theater. Great, um, uh, yeah, totally worth the check out. And, and given that you mentioned Powered by the Apocalypse, let me, let me throw out a bit of a name and you, you can tell me if you dipped into this. Um, Monster of the Week. I have done Monster of the Week, um, I kind of like, my thing with Monster of the Week, I love it, it's super fun, it's much more for the action horror type stuff for me, of like, you know, um, uh, because of the way, the PBTA systems, I feel like, are more for like, adventures than like, high stakes, like the high stakes is always narrative sort of thing, um, and I like some other PBTA games better, but Monster of the Week still, I, it was my first PBTA game, so, uh, you know, there's always going to be a soft spot for it. Mm -hmm. And... There's a few other um, there's a few other horror horror based games that I'm curious if you had um, dipped into at at some point. Mm -hmm. um, one of the so I'm just gonna give I'm just gonna give names and you can t you can tell me if you had dipped into it or are familiar with it or so or something to that extent. Um, don't rest your head. I have not. Um, oh, all right. Um, Trail of Cthulhu. Um, which is I, I'm using that as a stand-in for any of the games that use the Gumshoe engine. Um, then I might have played it. I definitely haven't run a game in it. Um, but but for my Cthulhu stuff, it has been Call of Cthulhu mostly. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. Um, Inspectors. I haven't played it, man. Now I'm gonna look like I I don't know my stuff. I, I swear, I swear I'm a fan, um, but no, I haven't. Uh, I'll go. I'll go with something a little more recent. Um, Shiver. Oh, uh, yes. I'm was not a big fan of Shiver. Um, that's part of the thing for Slash. Um, was that I wanted to make? I don't know. I felt like Shiver was a little bit complicated. I I it felt like it for me. I don't mean to bash. Shiver, I'm sure it's it's great, but it just felt like it didn't get the kind of... The, the aspect I like of a lot of horror stuff is the cinematic feel, and I don't know. It, it didn't feel like it, it worked as well as some, like, PBTA stuff or Call of Cthulhu. Um, yeah. Um, don't mean to bash Shiver, Shiver, but I played it, would not necessarily do it again. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've, enjo I've enjoyed it personally um, for, for, what it, for what it is. Um this one this one is prob this one is probably going is probably going to be a bit of a reach but um VHS very very horror stories I have not that's is uh that sounds interesting though mm -hmm. That's an that is another one of the growing list of of, ent of entries 
com coming out of it, coming out of Italy. <laughs> nice. It's like I have my own little subdivision of ge of games in my library that are from Italians. But to the, now to that e to that end, I will I will note that obviously Mystery Science Theater holds a special place for me, be, give, given where I come from. <laughs> yeah. But one of the, it, one of the things that I find interesting is that you're is that you're using a die system that's somewhat somewhat similar to fudge dice, but not exactly in the sense of it being symbol based. Mm -hmm. oh. So as as I understand it, you are, you're generating. Um, skill die, bonus die, and and, and penalty die in ver in various forms, and you yes. you want to ultimately get more pluses than minuses. So, with that in mind, what is the what is the star supposed to what is the star and skull supposed so, to represent? So the thing, uh, the way that the game works is as follows. Uh, most of your stuff, uh, like your you have like a list of attributes, kind of powered by the apocalypse style, that are for your skill dice. Um, and your bonus dice and penalty dice come from your character traits and some, you know, other outside circumstances. So, like, um, I wanted to do that because, like, character traits um, and having it... I, I like the idea of it not being like, oh, I have speed, so I am fast. But, like, you know, if your character's smart, but they're not book smart, they're observant, and then you can do something like that with the character trait. Anyway, uh, the stars are actually what you'll get to succeed. I, I base this system on... Have you played Time Stories by any chance? Once. Uh, well... Um, I, I was inspired by the dice system there, um, which is that the stars and skulls, those are actually, the stars are actually whether you succeed or fail. So the stars are like, oh, you need two stars to succeed. This is a DC2 check. Uh, the skulls are rare, but they like are an anti-star, basically. Now the pluses and minuses, that's kind of drawn from like the fate, si uh, not fate system, a uh, genesis system um, of it being like, it's opportunities and setbacks. So those are good side effects and bad side effects. So the pluses and minuses are actually for like kind of narrative consequences for your mm -hmm. role, you know, like if you're running and you run away but you roll too many minuses, you might trip, you might hurt your ankle, um, you might get out of breath. So a butt um, and. and. Uh, yes, exactly. So there's a, there's, you can be a yes and, a yes but, no and, a no but. Thing. And I liked that because I like the I, I I love the idea of the potential to fail upwards in games. That's part of the thing with uh, by the apocalypse for me. And I like the idea of it being horror. And the way I designed the dice is such that if you succeed, more likely you, you get setbacks just because of the way that the dice faces are like, which means that you're more likely to succeed, but something goes a little wrong. And that's like all the time in horror movies, you know, like uh, in Halloween uh, when uh, Lori should she should be able to kill. Michael Myers, but she passes out right before, and then he's gone. Um, and uh, you know, and then if you fail, you're if you're more likely to fail upwards because of the way that the the faces are oriented. And that's you know, you always got to have that chance to be like, it, it's it's bad if everything goes to crap. It's good if things go to crap, but you've got somewhere to go. So uh, I wanted to make that separate from success, so that it wasn't just. Uh, I, I like systems that, that is not just succeed or fail, but of other things. So that's why the stars and skulls, they're actually for, like, the success level. Pluses and minuses, that's for the side effects. The yes and, the yes but. Mm -hmm. So, looking at the example archetype, would it be fair to say that um, archetypes in Slash are similar to playbooks, but not quite? Yes, they're definitely very playbook-inspired in that they have, you know, you fill in your little bubbles. I want to make them easy to use. Part of the reason I like Power by the Apocalypse stuff is I like the idea of, you know, you pick it up, you fill out your thing in, in 10 minutes if you want, you can make it. And it's very story-driven where it's like, oh, connections to the players. And uh, it's kind of a role. It's not just like, I have these spells. It's like kind of your role in your party. Um, now, the thing that makes it a little bit different is the act development. Powered by the, a lot of Power by the Apocalypse games have the whole experience thing where you know you can if you fail rolls you take experience or if you do certain things you take experience. Um, but this one is based on like movie act structure. So when you move to Act Two, it's kind of like a level up. You get some more abilities. Um, but they're very similar to playbooks in the like abilities idea. Um, the thing that they do have a couple of other things like I mentioned, they have traits on the front side. Um, then yet you also have a spot for your phobias and that's a little different. But 
I kind of wanted to give it the idea, like the simplicity of a playbook, but I wanted to tailor it for like the three act film structure and the idea of because a lot of what horror movies are about are you know for whatever reason you're running around for the beginning of the story and then by the end you're strong enough to uh, fight back, escape, whatever. Um, so I wanted to emulate that with the kind of you gain abilities across acts. So I, I wanted to make sure you could level up over time, but I realized that failing, like the whole failing thing and power, like things like Monster of the Week where you fail and mark experience didn't necessarily work because a lot of times if you fail too much in horror movies, you just die. Um, so, and I, I didn't want to like incentive. I, 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 one thing that Powered by the Apocalypse games have incentivized, I've noticed when I'm running it as a GM, is that a lot of players will just roll checks to fail so that they can mark experience. And I, I didn't necessarily I didn't necessarily want that. I wanted people, because of the whole idea of opportunities and setbacks, I wanted people to really consider when they're going to do a check because, you know, it's the kind of thing where, like, if you're pushing hard enough to do this, there's going to be cons- side effects, probably, which will affect the story, so. Mm-hmm. Oh. Now, now, when it comes to the traits and phobias thing that I think they see here, um, I look at that, and th- maybe this is something that's addressed in the book, but I'm reminded of the big pet peeve that I had with that I've had with um, Fate since I start since I started um, running Fate all those years ago with the Dresden Files, mm-hmm. and that pre- the, that is how Fate treats aspects. Aspects are an example of what I like to call blank check design, of a, a certain th- a certain um a certain mechanic where where you where it's about f- it's about filling in a certain prompt, but unless you give people proper guidance on what is on what it on what is or isn't crossing the line when it comes to a when it comes to a prompt that can be literally anything, you're gonna you're gonna end up with um with problems. So I'm curious yeah. if in the if in the full book you have examples of traits and phobias so that people can kind of have a um a general idea on where on where the line should be. Yes. So the the full book the, in the playtest guide we didn't get into it as much just because it's a playtest guide it's mm-hmm. kind of smaller. Um but in the full book there's a huge amount of examples of traits and uh examples of how GMs or directors should run them. Uh, my whole thing with traits was I wanted the idea of the the what with what you're saying about blank check the, the like design one of the things that I think is hard is because if you have a system like in D and D like a skill check there are 19 skills it's going to fit into the 19 skills I think there are 19 maybe I'm wrong doesn't matter um, point is it fits into one of those things but I wanted to make sure that traits didn't necessarily need to fit into one of those things, but I also wanted to make sure, like you said, that someone doesn't just choose the trait, I'm good at everything, right? Because that's not going to help. Um, it, it lends to things being overpowered. So to, to work on that for traits, I um, I made sure there, there's a lot of examples in the book. Um, there's there's um, examples of different ways you can do traits, um, like... Um, you know, there's personality traits, physical traits, um, relationship traits. Like those are sort of uh, similar to the thing questions you see on Powered by the Apocalypse books, um, and like kind of skills that you have. Um, I found that um, it does take intervention on the GM's part. Like the GM has to decide what they're going to allow. But I've made sure to add in with all the playtesting I've done. I've kind of found what sort of level of trait works. Um, so from the trait side, there's definitely going to be a lot in the book that will help um, with that. It is going to be up to the GM ultimately, um, but I, there, I think there's enough advice in there where the, the GM will be able to decide. As for phobias, um, I found phobias, uh, there are a list of phobias, um, but phobias are something that um, as part of Slash has been interesting to include because some games rely heavily on phobias, right? And other games are like, it doesn't matter because if you're afraid of water there's not going to be much water in this campaign so what i've realized is the way i've described it in the full book um, for phobias is particularly that the phobias don't need to come up all the time there, there are certain um, phobias that you might choose and you might not they might not show up there's going to be enough scary in the thing uh there but i've i've tried to design it such that um and there's advice for this as well the things that people choose 
are vague enough so that they might show up once or twice. It's not meant to be like a thing that is pushing the story unless you discuss it beforehand. Phobias are more like for an added kick of fear. There's already a whole like fear track system that I think does the whole, oh, you're getting afraid very well beyond phobias. Phobias are kind of just the cherry on top of that. Originally, they were a bigger part of design because of the inspiration I've taken from like Call of Cthulhu and stuff. But in the end, I realized like a lot of times it's not the specific fear in in horror it's not like i'm afraid of this it's that this thing is scary to everyone so yeah mm -hmm. so true and if you if you want an example of 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 um what i'm of a of how of a good of a good way that the um blank check thing was was addressed i always reference the one unique thing in um 13th age which by the way 13th age is really damn good um, where it go it goes into it goes it into great lengths about what a good or bad idea of a one unique thing is with because so, because there's a two page spread midway through of examples um, with the subtypes of players creating the story cool idea consequences later seemingly innocuous too much for first level deliberately pushing it you know that that sort that sort of thing and it's it's it is more about establishing the line so that you don't have somebody doing the putting in a tr putting in a trait of just ab of just about everything um yeah now something something i am curious about cuz you mentioned you didn't want people um intentionally fu intentionally fudging r fumbling roles just so that they could get experience points easily. Uh, I'm guess yeah. I'm guessing that you ha that you're having it that there has to be a agreed amount of risk in order to get in order to get XP from a failed roll. Like there have to uh, be well, this, tangible consequences. This system doesn't have the experience. Well, technically, one the fool has a has a, the fool archetype has that, but everything else the leveling up is just through act story based it's not like getting experience from the failed role but the whole idea what i was saying with that is that i kind of wanted rolling to be especially with the whole plus and like the opportunities and setbacks thing i wanted the role to be like something is going to happen you know it, because i think that um and a lot of rpgs they they mention this but i've seen a lot of gms not necessarily play it that way we're like if you're looking around a room, you don't necessarily always need to roll a perception check. Sometimes you just can look around and find it, right? If, if, if you could take time and find it. And I wanted to make sure that in Slash, when you're making a roll, there is tangible consequences, you know? It's, um, and uh, again, a lot of games do want the roll to be, uh, God, what was it? I was looking through rule books the other day and there was one that said it really well of like, um, when, you, when you have a chance you only roll when you have a, things have a chance of going very wrong. It, the yeah. point being that I wanted to to really hit home on that idea and not make there be checks that are just like, oh, you know, you fail, but nothing really happens. You know, if you fail, maybe nothing happens, but if it does, something is happening behind the scenes. You know, mm -hmm. something is happening, some big clue that you missed or some something that that is going on behind you. Um, I didn't want it to just be like, you know, when you're stuck in the cave in D&D and rolling the investigation check five times to try to find the little crack in the wall that you can slip through. Yeah, and so. that that does tie into the concept of fail forward, which I'm guessing you're familiar with. Of course, yes. Oh. And in, incidentally, this is also the reason why um, I, pre I at my table, I pretty much banned spot checks. Mm -hmm. It's like, you've got, you've got, you've got five senses, if you, there, what, it didn't make it didn't make sense to me that you have to roll for the chance to see something. If you can, yeah. like, if you go to if you go to an eye exam, you're gonna you're gonna be looking at the same set of letters every time. Yeah, <laughs> they might they and might change it up so that people don't try and pull a memorization trick. But the point is, if there if there's no there's no chance that you're not gonna see that the third le the third letter in the fourth row is an E. You're either going to yeah. see it or you're not. Yes. And I think for me, that was one of the things with Slash was like time, right? If you have time, 
and you have your senses, you can see something. The time, the, when I do ask for, like, smarts rolls, uh, which is the stat in the game that it uses for, for um, kind of perception-y stuff, to, like, look around, it is when you are rushed, it is when something is moving quickly, it is the sort of thing of it being... It's not just, do you see this? It's not just, do you see this in the room? Did you find the little... Um, that is more... I, I like making that stuff more role-playing, you know, like... If you're looking around the room for a monster and you tell me you look up and the monster's on the ceiling, you're going to see the monster. Mm -hmm. If you don't tell me you look up, then maybe you don't um, because, uh, you know, it's more fun that way. And uh, that is something yeah. that I, th I think a lot of I think a lot of games fail to address because this this is a ca this is a case where my sa my saying about tradition being a sweet poison comes into play. A lot of a lot of people, whether it be des whether it be both designers, players, or GMs, have this have the bad habit of looking at a dice roll as a binary. Of you, you either succeed or you fail. And this was something I hammered home because I remember a lot of people complaining that they couldn't figure out how a game like um, Everway was supposed to work. Because Everway doesn't do that. It doesn't do it doesn't do dice for one, but its fortune deck is not about do you succeed or do you fail, but about giving a prompt for what happens next and having the table interpret that prompt. But a lot in a lot of but in a lot of cases, people view view that di view that die roller that randomizer as succeed or fa or you succeed or you fit or you fail at a given action and i think i think with a lot i think with the advent of powered by the apocalypse and a few other games we're starting to see people try and break that habit but it's still a long way it's still a long ways because it's a habit you're it's a habit that's been established that was established for about 20 or 30 years that's not going to break all that easy Mm. Oh. Yeah, I'm. I I do I do think um, there there's a there's a I really like games that are failing forward or things that are um, where the, it's not just a binary success or fail. That was one of my biggest problems when I've kind I've kind of been switching away from things like D and D is that I, I I've even been looking into stuff like have, have you played Fiasco by any chance? Yes, um, I have. Yes, I have the bi the bigger question. Uh, the, bi the question I should ask I should ask in response is, um, which place at a fiasco? Because I've got way too many of them. I just got into it, so I've only played uh, the uh, the uh, suburbia one. I forget what it's called. Uh, the point is that was so fun to play, and the resolution mechanic is all like you're passing, you're picking up dice, right, or you're picking up cards. Um, and it doesn't. It, it's it's so narrative story based, yet it's so good. It so fits with the style of story it's trying to tell. The whole Coen Brothers vibe and things going wrong, but not really. This, there's small build up, and then everything goes wrong at once. And I think that that it's not a traditional system, you know, of it being like there, there's. It's you're right. It's so ingrained that you roll the die, the thing happens. But sometimes. You don't really need a die to tell you what's going to happen because you are you you know the story is set up a certain way and you know people players role playing is very good it's very good at deciding what happens next and you don't always rolling a die can help with the stuff that again where you know you don't know if it's going to succeed or fail there's an element of chance but sometimes if you're if you're telling a story there's things kind of line up in a certain way and it's going to work out a certain way and you don't need just you don't need just a success or fail prompts or things like then this happens can can be so much more fun to work with um that's what i was trying to do with like the opportunities and setbacks in this mm -hmm. uh, was that i still i i wanted to kind of get the best of both worlds with still having a success fail for like the actual because there's some tense moments in like horror stuff where you need to you need to succeed or fail um but i also wanted it to be like you know there are kind of prompts for where the story goes from there you know um and that makes it i feel like that makes it a lot more fun yeah also, I ch I checked. I have about two hundred fiasco playsets. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> oh. some so the some of some of them are some of them are official. A lot of them are unofficial. Um. Mm -hmm. Some some of and some of them are ju are just meant to be 
um, adaptations of other games into into the fiasco system, like A Grog's Life is a fiasco version of Ars Magica. Nice. Um, well, I, I think the game does lend itself to a lot of customization, yeah. so it makes sense. But... Now, when... when when it comes to the ki- the killer, um, I know that there's the deck in order to cu- in order to custom make one. But is creating a killer in is it done in the sense of ha- of there being a set of killer pl- um, playbooks slash archetypes, or does it take a different approach? So um, there are a few pl- killer archetypes, um, but the the killer archetypes are a bit more loose. It's not like a a strict playbook. It's more like suggested abilities that they can have. Um, the the way that the killer was so the archetypes are kind of just there for like kind of like base like suggestions. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, the the killer creation system through the cards is that there's like a list of abilities. There's a list of uh, like bases for the killer where it's like oh this is the uh, you know the predator killer. It's uh you know animalistic. This is the ghost whatever. And you you can kind of combine the abilities, weapons, bases, motives, and stuff to kind of randomly generate a killer. Sort of like the tables that you'll see in, in other stuff. Um, but that is super fun for building something on the fly. It's also... A, a lot of the building a killer, like a lot of the stuff in the book, is more about the story aspect of why the person is killing. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there are archetypes, there are abilities, and there are certainly guidelines on how much health they should have, especially depending on the survivor you're facing. Because, like, obviously, if you're doing an aliens, you're going to need maybe more than one monster, maybe a really big monster, you know, because everyone's armed. If you're doing a regular alien, the first alien, then one monster is enough because it's just a bunch of space strikers. So there are a lot of rules, or not rules, but, like, suggestions on that part, but... Um, I tended to to realize originally I was going for a more approach of like oh these are the killers this is a killer archetype but I realized a lot of stories it's more about how when you see the killer and kind of it's more of a story thing than a mechanical thing right because slash and a lot of horror stuff is not a war game type game where it's not like you're there are combat rules um, but it's not like you're going to, uh, you know, be fighting against all this creature's abilities and whatnot. It's it's it does have abilities, of course, but a lot of them are more like this is when they, you know, they pop out of the shadows and do ambush killing. They uh, they're a phone based killer, like in Scream. Um, it's the sort of thing where the killer is made to drive the narrative forward, right? So the killer um, is is made. Um, First, from a story perspective, we do like a kind of who, what, where, when, why, how, the six W's, except one of them isn't really a W, uh, sort of thing to get that ball running. Um, and then, while there are abilities, honestly, in the playtests I've run as a GM, and in the playtest I've seen other people run when I've when they've been GMs, a lot of people are, it's pretty easy to take liberties on what you want your killer to be able to do. Because, you know, it, it's going to... And it's it's the system is such that it's pretty easy to customize that, and while there are like suggestions and great r- things for randomly building a killer, heck, there's like um, you know people are creative, you know, with their monsters, and it is much more of a system like Monster of the Week where it's like come up with whatever crazy monster killer you want than it is like D and D where it's like this is the thing stat block. Mm-hmm. Which is per- is perfectly fine, especially since. Um... No matter how big you make a monster manual, in practice, most GMs are only going to be are only going to be using a minority of what's in that monster manual, and give them enough time, they'll eventually run out. Which mm-hmm. is why I've been tr- which is why I've campaigned for years that something that we need to normalize in games that have enemies or best years or whatnot is a way for players to customize it. Mm-hmm. A lot of people say we'll just we'll just tweak just tweak one of the existing ones. That's a bandage. <laughs> no, I think that's that was somewhat of what I was wanting to do with the uh, the customizing part of Slash was that like there's so many great options like I like ideas for killers, but they're more like building blocks, you know. So it's more about how you arrange those blocks, and even the the customization that is mentioned in Slash for that part, like the. Uh, 
the actual kind of more stat blocky, not stat blocky, but like abilities and um, you know stuff like that. Um, even that is is a little bit small. Like even that is not going to be enough to to satisfy GMs forever. Yeah. So I kind of realized I don't know. I like it. Most of the monsters I make and everything in D and D as well are going to be stuff that I made up. And I know a lot of GMs like to, especially with something like horror, where you can have a crazy, you know, monster idea, killer idea, and you can just be like, "I'm going to make this." And how do you make that? Uh, how do you make that a, you know, a character? If your monster is like, if the have you seen It Follows by any chance? Yeah. Anyway, the 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 monster in that is definitely not something you could find an archetype or stat block for, yet it's still really scary, you know? The monster and alien, yeah, sure, you could have a stat block uh, for the xenomorph, but, like, there is... that's It's not as much about the stat block as it is about the fact that it's kind of just running around and seems to have every defense, you know, the acid the popping out of people's guts, um, that um, it's more about the feeling of not knowing what the thing does than the specifics of what the thing does. Mm -hmm. Now, to that end, I'd like to I'd like to put it to the test a little bit. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna name a few mo a few monsters from classic horror movies, and I'd like you to tell me which archetype they they would fit they would fit into, or if it would be a bit if it'd be a bit too a bit tricky to do it. Cool. Okay. Jason Voorhees. Um, that is that the Jason from Friday the Thirteenth? I'm assuming. Yeah, and um. Side side note, I will point out, some somebody decided to be really evil with a Jason statue and actually hit it in the bottom of in the bottom of a lake that was frequented by um, lake divers. <laughs> Ooh. Which wow. is so evil, I wish I came up with it. It's it's funny for sure. Um, so uh, yeah, we we have um a archetype called it's gone through a couple changes but the brutal or the relentless and that's sort of a michael myers jason type of the thing that does not die it's a dude um and their whole ability is kind of based around the idea of like an obsession a kind of rage to kill sort of thing i think that would be a great archetype i think uh of what we have there's also um some great abilities for like the sort of ambush killer that jason is where he kind of you know, pops out, uh, not really sets a trap, like a Scooby-Doo villain type of trap, but like, you know, pops out, kills some people, pops away. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are ambush style abilities, and I would say that for him, the brutal slash relentless archetype. Again, the name's gone through some changes, but that would work the best. All right. The Thing. The Thing is, now there are two interesting ideas for this. The, we just unlocked this thing called the Mimic archetype, which is the classic, like, the Thing is a dog, the Thing is now a person. I personally think the thing might work better as an abomination, which is the archetype for the weird Eldritch Horror. Mm -hmm. um, or, and the thing is not quite an Eldritch Horror, but there is the scene at the end of the thing, at least the, the John Carpenter version, where it becomes, you know, the giant monster that just grows and grows and grows. Um, so I think um, if you're playing for a more like the first part of the thing where it's just shape-shifting, um, then you could do the mimic. But I personally am partial towards the abomination of it being like, the Abomination has abilities that allow it to regrow, to like look grotesque, to kind of to be this thing from another world, which fits perfectly with the thing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, the Xenomorph. Um, that would be a predator archetype, pretty pretty clearly for me. Um, the predator archetype is the thing that is like a hunter. It is kind of animalistic. Um, it could be a werewolf. It definitely could be the Xenomorph. Uh, there are also some great abilities that allow for like a kind of retribution where when the you hit the killer the killer hits back that would fit perfectly with the acid blood um sort of deal um and the predator archetype is also focused on being very fast and like jumpy and that is very xenomorph to me you know popping up from the rafters and landing on people yeah. sort of deal um incidentally the incidentally the thing i will always find most terrifying about the xenomorph is that the suit actor was trained in mime <laughs> Nice. I did not know that. <laughs> he was trained in Tai Chi and and in mime, which make which makes sense. Um, especially since the original thing from another they wanted to they wanted to have the xenomorph be at as well alien as they could, not just a guy in a suit, which was something. Yeah. Um, which was something something that Rid that Ridley Scott was very critical of. And give, given that he's another person who came who came out of the Roger Corman school 
school, I can understand that. Because Roger Corman, he he's responsible for a lot of people getting their big break into filmmaking, but he's also a cheapskate. <laughs> um, but in, in that same vein, I, I, I'd be tempted to bring up the T-800 for this, but that would fall into the brutal category, so we've been there, done that. So let's yeah. go with the T-1000 instead. Uh, which is the T-1000? That was uh, the, that was the one in Terminator 2. Oh, the, the Melty one? Yeah. Or was that... Yeah. Um, so the T-1000, um, uh, that's one that doesn't quite um, super fit. I think the whole shape-shifting-y thing could fit well as a mimic. Um, a mimic does not necessarily mean they mimic things. It does mean it's it's a lot... It's like, you know, shape-shifting or mm-hmm. melting down to look like it could fit that. Um, but I would say that that's one where I would use the cards instead of the archetype, where, like, you could get the mimic kind of base, and then you could put in some more brutal uh, type ability, um, like, character abilities, for it being this killing machine robot type thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that's one of the things where the strict archetype doesn't work, but the system still is in place such that you have kind of the the base, and then you have abilities to throw from other things. Yep. Um... The, so here's here's another classic, the Yatuja, you know the the titular predator in well predator. Yeah, well I think that I, I wonder what archetype that would be. Uh, probably the predator, um, but it would be a little bit different because the predator is um, well it's a little it's it's uh, but it still fits the kind of hunting down people vibes. I might throw in some uh, brutal abilities there. Um, I might even throw in some um, the masked abilities there. That's an archetype we haven't talked about, even though that's more for like villains from like Scream or Scooby Doo. But the kind of um, hunting and stalking your prey sort of thing um, would fit. But I would definitely go still with the base of the Predator. Mm-hmm. Um, Badass, because I gotta do. I gotta. If we're doing classics, I have to bring up Evil Dead. Yes. Um, uh, so, fun fact: I haven't seen. I've only seen Evil Dead's one through three. It, is, is Ash bad? No, I'm. I'm talking. Remember, you had the bad, the Deadite that took Ash's appearance and called himself oh. Bad Ash. Oh, Basically yeah, yeah, the grown yeah. Grown-up version of the hand of the hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I need to see that movie again to tell you <laughs> to tell you. Um, I'm actually gonna watch it tonight. Uh, so I I, I could tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would need to see that again to to, to know it a little bit better. Um, but um, I don't. I um, trying to think. I mean, honestly, for most humanoid killers, um, I'm a big fan of using the the masked. That's just a title. It doesn't need to have the mask. And the brutal are probably the best for that. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the mask just means that they kind of vaguely look they look humanoid and they kind of um but um yeah i guess i i could tell you later after i see the movie tonight again to, to tell you um uh, more about it yep so freddy krueger uh freddy Kr- so interestingly enough for there was a there's an archetype we were considering making that was entirely freddy and krueger inspired that was called the nightmare um people ended up voting on the mimic instead so um oh well but i still think freddy krueger could be done as a, the, the ghost archetype. Well, he's not really a ghost. The ghost has a lot of abilities that involve like a sort of ethereal realm, and you know, dream realm totally works with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that while his actual abilities, you could pull from, um, you know, like the mast probably, or um, even the mimic. Um, I think that his base of the ghost of this whole kind of ethereal realm, not moving through the world normally, um, that whole kind of. Uh, the ghost is also based around you don't kill them in traditional ways, kind of like you know Freddy Krueger. Um, mm-hmm. So I think even though he's not really a ghost, sort of, um, he does fit the ghost archetype. Yeah. Um, well. Um, have you ever seen the film Virus? I have not. That one had a had a kind of sentient electricity that got that got into the electronics of a of a large boat. And and was ba- was basically making these mach- these machine these machine monstrosities that a- that acted as the agents. I'm putting this as a stand-in for those for the for those horror movies where the where the hor- where the monster is 
is all-encompassing and acts through agents instead of acting directly. Um, it certainly yeah. doesn't help that I've been playing the System Shock remake um, lately, and you have Shodan, who, ba who's basically ev basically everywhere, but acting through the electronics of the um, station. Yeah. Well, okay, let's see. Um, first of all, if the agents are humanoid or something like that, um, or really if the agents are, like, creatures, then the Horde archetype can work really well. There's, like, a whole thing about having, like, instead of it being one thing, it's kind of a group. There's also a Mastermind archetype, which I think could work well with this. Oh, it, um, it was originally intended for, like, Saw-type characters, um, but the whole intention of the Mastermind is that they control everything, right? The Mastermind mm -hmm. knows what's going to go down. Yeah. So... Um, so I think the mastermind archetype, uh, again, I haven't seen Virus, so I don't know, but if their whole thing is that they know it's going to go down and they seem to be one step ahead and be in control of everything, mm -hmm. uh, then, yeah, the mastermind archetype fits well with that. And if they have, um, minions or something like that, you can pull from the horde. Yeah. Um, I think th the, fi the final one, the, the final one that I, that... Is that is coming to mind? I was get, I was gonna bring up the blob, but I think I think that one's a little bit too easy. So instead, instead, let's go with let's go with the Cronenberg fly. From the fly? Is that wait? Hold on. Mm. Uh, let me let me look this up for a you know, second. The fly is as in the I have to I have to bring that up because the because. There was a movie called The Fly decades before that. Is this is this the I've only seen the 1958 The Fly. Is this from the 1986 The Fly? Yeah, the one that I'm specifically referring to the one that um Cronenberg did. Oh, I I haven't seen that. Um uh, so unfortunately I don't know. Could you describe it a bit? <sighs> the Cronenberg is very good at this gradual kind of body horror, and mm -hmm. the setup with that one was that he was the scientist in it was developing a teleportation device. And swaps, yeah, with the fly, and then they get combined, right? They get combined, and he starts taking on he starts taking on fly traits, and it starts getting more and more grotesque. Yeah, I, if it's if it's all about body horror growing grotesque, I think the abomination works pretty well. Um, the Abomination is for a wide range of things, but there's a huge um, part of it that is um, a, a, a set of abilities and stuff that is attributed to just being gross and being kind of inhuman. A lot of it is fear-based of people just being, you know, scared of it. A lot of it is based on um, kind of this weird inhuman form. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say Abomination is what you'd pull from from that. Yeah. And... Well, while this isn't from a horror well, this isn't from a horror series. It 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 is horror adjacent enough that I think I think using it as a concept would be interesting. Um, are you familiar with the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who? Of course, yes. Now that is something that you're going to not need an archetype for. I think that that is something where it is a concept, right? The idea is you look away, and that itself makes an excellent horror right mm -hmm. um but it's not a horror that's particularly an archetype because if you make that an archetype you're very limited so that's something where i feel like yeah that doesn't fit into the archetype system but um fortunately um i think you can still make it there's still rules to make a great killer with it i think you could because there's a lot of them the angels naturally lend themselves to being slightly a horde but obviously you're the whole gimmick of the angels um a lot of Doctor Who monsters, like the Cylons, also have a great gimmick. That's uh, wait, Cylons? Know. That's Battlestar Galactica. Oh, no, the Cylons, the uh, people you look away, hmm. and then from Doctor Who. Anyway, season uh, six yeah. of the new series, I think. Anyway, the point is, um, the Weeping Angels. Um, yeah, the, the 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 gimmick is super fun, but it is something that um, you know you, a creative uh, GM will be able to bring to life in the system, and it's not. Um, while it is kind of a horde and that there's a lot of them, it is going to be something that is, uh, you know, y you'll you'll make that yourself because the Weeping Angels are not just a monster. There, there's a whole horror, a whole story. But like in the original Weeping Angels episode, you know, it's the whole thing. They're all angels. 
Uh, spoiler alert, um, if you didn't know, but you already knew, probably. Statutes, um, pa- statutes passed. <laughs> yes. Um, so that thing itself is so intertwined with the story. It's so it's so much a mystery. And it's, first of all, a great episode, obviously, as yeah. I'm saying about it. But it's something that you can't really sum up in a generalized archetype. It's something that is specific enough that you need to make it yourself. So I know this is a way of me saying that there's no archetype in the system, but I really think with things that get, with any archetype also, there are going to be gimmicks you add, right? Like we we specifically put in some abilities that would make the predator work with the xenomorph type thing. But you know, there are going to be some monster abilities that you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't fit. And there are rules on creating your own abilities, getting it to be added. So yeah. yeah. Um, the final one that I'd be cu- I'd be curious about is how you would handle the. This isn't uh, this is there isn't one per- one specific example of this, but the but essentially the ma- the mad the mad psych the mad psychic or the paranormal kid. The ex- examples that come to mind for this sort of thing is stuff like um, Carrie, to a lesser extent Akira. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I didn't think I'd bring up Akira in a conversation like this. Um, well, who's to the, say? Um, um, the, o- the Omen and the Exorcist. Yeah, so we're in development of a witch archetype. It was, um, I don't know if we're going to reach the stretch goal that we had for it, um, but the witch archetype was going to be not necessarily just for witches, but for people with magical powers, sort of the paranormal-ish powers. Mm-hmm. Um, if that gets developed, then obviously it would work great. Um, if we don't reach that stretch goal, then the ghost has a lot of magical esque abilities, and you could take parts from that. But obviously, some of the abilities won't fit. You know, you'll have to pick and choose which ones work. Probably combine it with. Um, honestly, if it's like the sort of paranormal kid, I'd combine it with a survivor archetype instead of a killer archetype, just because of it being like part of the fun of those movies is like, you know, Carrie. Carrie is a is a kid. Uh, they have these paranormal powers. Uh, they end up becoming not necessarily evil evil, but they definitely cause a lot of harm and a lot of destruction. But deep down, they are also just a person. Um, so, so yeah. Um, then again, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure somebody could find a way to make a to make a to to uh, make the, to make a survivor that is more that is more akin to De- more akin to Dexter than anything else. Oh yes, um, certainly. Um, no, there's a lot of chances for stuff like that there. Um, but, like, the whole survivor uh, thing, like, the survivor archetypes, the survivor archetypes are more um, less loose than the killer just because they fit a lot of, like, the tropey things. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, there there are certainly, certainly ways to make stuff like that. And, um, honestly, you know, not every survivor does... It doesn't mean they're a good guy if they're a survivor. We've seen a lot in the playtests... We've seen a lot of a-holes and a lot of people that are kind of a little bit evil, but they're on your side. So you know you got to work with them to survive. Yeah. Now, what are you? What would you be shooting for as far as a total page count? Um, the page count right now is at about 160, but we're looking to be like about 200. Uh, this is not including the um, the mysteries and horrors that we have. So in addition to the 160 to 200, which is the the rule book. Um, and like you'll also there's also a PDF copy of this uh, series called the Muddy Brook Mysteries. These are like a forest based, um, you know, classic kind of people lost in the woods type of horror. And there are three main like kind of adventures horrors as we call them. And then like these things that are short called shorts. They're like one page uh, sort of deals where it's not as much of like all the rules and ideas. It's more just like this is what the horror is going to look like. Um, and then we also have the the uh, two two people um, that are backers. They backed up the director tier. They're making other of those, so we'll get more PDFs. I think we'll end up with about six to seven uh, adventure PDFs, uh, which are separate from the book. So it's 200 pages in the book of rules, archetypes, whatnot. There's a bit in the cards for the horror correct uh, horror the killer creation if uh, you do get the cards, and then there is um, the PDF. Honestly, I have no idea how long the PDF is going to be. Um, it's getting longer and longer as we keep on adding stuff, um, but it is it is basically seven one shots um, to one to three shots. So yeah, so, uh, five to seven I should say because again, not sure exactly where we'll end with the stretch goals, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. So, 
with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? I know it's I know it says January on the Kickstarter, but I but this is one of those things I'm obligated to ask. Yeah, I mean, January is what realistically we put down. I would love to get it out sooner. The book itself, like the the actual pages of the book, is almost entirely done. Um, the only thing we are working on right now is um, some of the stretch goal stuff we finished. So, like, the detective archetype just got added. Um, and we the, our artist needs to finish up a little bit more of the art um, and uh, the killer archetypes, as I mentioned. Um, so so that that's almost done. Um, just in in that form, and then we're gonna just make sure it's layout designed and whatever. Um, but just because of like shipping the physical books, um, I still have to say January again. I really want to get it out by like November, but I can't promise that or say that. Um, so so yeah. So I can I can certainly get I can certainly get that. So. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to the temple to enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. I definitely enjoyed being part of the madness. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>